Hey guys, if you can think about how you found this podcast, maybe it's on Instagram or TikTok, maybe someone shared it with you. I don't run ads for the show or have sponsorships, so the only way this grows is through word of mouth. If this was valuable for you in any way, my only ask is if you could share this with someone who you think would help their investing journey or business. Thanks a lot, and let's get to the episode. Welcome back to SEO the Best. I'm your host, Michael Chang. It's my great pleasure, actually, to welcome my friend, Matt Gardner, to the show. Matt, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, man. It's a super pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm excited to jump on, man. I've been listening for a while. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. As a background, Matt connected with, with Liz, my wife. Gosh, I think 2015, I don't know, a long time ago. Yeah, I think 2018 time frame. But yeah, it was, it's was. it been a while. It's been at least five years. It's six years now. It's crazy. Yeah. Like the bigger pockets to oh, yeah. to now having actual real relationships. I'm really excited yeah. to to explore this conversation with you. And Matt, what, but why don't, before I start off, Matt, why don't I give you a chance to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Matt Gardner. I, I also go by Roar. So I was prior military, which I'm sure we'll get into. And so half the people who know me from the military days call me Roar. That was my call sign. And other people in my life call me Matt. So you can call me either one. It's totally fine. And beyond that, I'm a full-time real estate investor. So I spend all my time in real estate sales as an agent and in investing as, as an investor. Jumped in all sorts of niches that I'm excited to jump into and specifically a short-term rental, which is one of my passions for sure. So that's our uh, shared passion. Show. Yes. Our yes. shared passion, how we connected. And Matt is one of the, he's being very modest. He's one of the top real estate agents here. <laughs> Shout out to Matt. Shout out to Matt and his hard work, which we'll dive into. But Matt, before we start, we always have to show by this. Give me a memorable short-term rental story. Doesn't have to be the craziest one, but the most memorable. Go. Yeah. Yeah. And every time you say this, which is always fun to listen to, I you, you, you started a well where you were like, hey, for, for this best or whatever you said. And so the first thing that always comes to mind is like my very first guest that came with my very first short-term rental, because it wasn't just like a normal guest coming in. It was literally a group of people straight from China who were coming from China to, to my Airbnb in Destin. Yeah. And it was just one of those memorable things. It's my first guest. I'm going to meet them. I'm excited. So I went out and met them, but I didn't I guess I realized, but I didn't put two and two together that Airbnb was translating real time for me. So none of them spoke English. And so when I got there, it was just like, they they were the most obvious non-locals ever. It was a group of eight very tall Chinese men meeting and they were outside this pool with like girls with bikinis everywhere, but these guys all had suits on. They were just like trying to figure out where to go and what to do. And there there were so many lessons learned, but that I'll never forget that initial kind of like entrance into the Airbnb world of meeting this group of, and we, it was all pointy talky too, because we couldn't speak each other language. Yeah. It was hilarious. It was great. Like, so, yeah. the, the, the classic Google translate. And let's go. Look, okay, you, you survived. It's funny. Everyone always had, it's always everyone's first guess for some reason. It's always the first yeah. guess, the first well, one or two that people remember. But you've had, you've hosted many, many guests since yes. then, but let's, but you're not a full, I don't know if we can get into this. I don't like STRs, like the full the hosting STRs. It's not the full-time gig now, but why don't you just talk a little bit about your business? Sure, sure. So I spend about 50% of my time from the business perspective, like a business day, focusing on sales. So supporting investors in, in growing their portfolios or you know disposing whatever they're trying to get rid of in their portfolios. The other 50% of the time, I spend on my own portfolio. So I have about 750 doors right now across the range of niches, anything from flips to short-term rentals to mid-term rentals, long-term rentals, and then syndications as well. So apartment complexes. And then I've had a couple RV and mobile home parks as well. So I cover the breadth there. And okay. on the agent side and the sales side, I, like I said, 95% of my clients are investors. It's primarily the focus. Okay. And that's the point I want to double click on today is working with investor clients, specifically short-term rental, short-term rental clients. And that's how I originally we got connected was we were looking for a real estate agent that had specific expertise in short-term rentals. We had already been doing rental arbitrage. We had a portfolio in the Northeast where rental arbitrage, again, for folks that don't know, is where you rent a property and then you re-rent it on Airbnb with the landlord's permission, and then you earn a spread between the two. But we had already already built a portfolio. We knew what we were doing-ish, and we wanted to find someone that could speak the same language. So we need to talk a little bit about that. Why, I just asked the direct question, like, why is it important for someone that is looking to invest in short-term rentals to find a real estate agent and find an agent that is also an expert or at least knowledgeable, deeply knowledgeable about the space? Yeah, I, it's like almost the story we were just sharing with the Chinese guests coming over to, to stay at my Airbnb. When you don't speak the same language, 
things are just so much more difficult. You know what I mean? Like you can't even try to convey what you're trying to get across to the agent if you're if he doesn't even know what you're saying. If you say, hey, I'm looking for a specific cash and cash return. And they're just like, oh, this one should cover your mortgage. And you're like, man, like there's so much more that goes into it. Like it's not just pay up, pay off your mortgage. You know what I mean? It's just that baseline level of knowledge. It, it builds so much familiarity. And beyond that, you can just really convey your meaning, convey your thoughts and goals. Yeah. And without that, I feel like you're just... You, you can get the job done, but you're, you, it's going to be an uphill battle. Like I said, we can use Google Translate and get back and forth and try to get to the point where we're trying to find what we, we need to get there. But there's an easier path, right? If you just learn the language, if I spoke Chinese when I went there, you better believe we'd have a much better conversation with these guests <laughs> and they would have checked in much easier, but we got there. So that, that's a big thing. Just having that core foundational knowledge yeah. is huge in order to really just get the goal because every, every investor ultimately is looking for something slightly different, especially in the short-term rental space. A, a, a lot of people come down thinking they want purely cash flow and maximize their cash and cash return. But when you talk to them, you'll find out that, oh, actually I do come down to Destin three times a year. So I really want to use it. Or I'm really more concerned about depreciation than I am cash flow because of X, Y, and Z. So once you dig down to the real objectives of what they're trying to do, then you can craft, craft the search and, and try to meet their objectives from there. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great point. Being able to really understand the client. And that's where we have, when we first got started and talking to you that weren't conversing in short-term rentals, like it just, you know, it's like the dog barking in the background. I don't know what it's, it might be asking to go out outside of pee or you know, it's hungry. I don't know. I mean, you have yeah. to just figure it out. And yeah. this time is money, right? You're an investor. You really have to be able to get to an answer quickly. So before we go there, let's talk about just like, where do you cover? Like you said, 50% of your time. Talk a little about your, the, the geograph, the geographies sure. that you cover. And then let's talk about your team too. Sure. Yeah. So we, we cover from Pensacola through Panama City Beach on the Emerald Coast of the Panhandle of Florida. Our bread and butter where we spend most of our time is Destin, Santa Rosa Beach, which is we call it 30A locally or Panama City Beach. It's where 80% of our sales probably occur. And then we also cover the Tampa area. So the greater Tampa area. So Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater, the greater Tampa area in general. And there it's surprisingly wildly different when it comes to short-term rental markets. Even seasonality being Gulf Coast, coastal Florida. I was so surprised when I made the transition from Emerald Coast, the panhandle of Florida down to Tampa and the seasons are even just different. You know what I say? Like the high season in the Destin, Florida market starts at March, ends in kind of August, where that's a low season almost in the Tampa market. Tampa market really starts to hit its stride in, in the November timeframe when the snowbirds start to come down, which is, it was, it was just interesting to see how every market really is different uh, when it comes to short-term rentals, even just a coastal Florida market. Yeah. And it speaks to the, the hyper-local knowledge. And that's one point I, I really, I, I always emphasize is you really want to find an agent that really knows that specific area. And an agent can be really good in Tennessee, for example, or in, in the Smoky Mountains, but like that agent probably is unlikely to be like that similar, have that similar level of expertise in that, in a different geography like Destin, which is like finding a, a broker that has like a broad team. I think that's actually important too, because like one person can't cover. Oh know, yeah. Yeah. There's no way I could cover that all by myself. Yeah. yeah. I have a team of agents. We have about 16 agents on the team that cover the swath and that, that number grows and shrinks all the time. We had 35 <laughs> agents last year and now we have 16 and it's always, that's the name of the game with real estate agents. Some, some try to set goals that they can't quite achieve or aren't, aren't willing to do the work to achieve sometimes in, in the real estate sales space. And let's talk a little about that. So let's talk about working with investors because there's two different types of investors, right? There's ones that are, you're just coming in, like you're, you don't, you, know, you may have one short term, you don't really know. You don't really know. So you're looking for an expert that can got handhold you through the process. And there are people probably more like me that's, Hey, look, I know exactly what I want. This is exactly <laughs> yeah. what I want and go and find that for me, whether it's on MLS off market, whatever it is. So maybe talk a little about that. Like how do you, let's start with the kind of quote unquote novice to beginner investor. Like how does a person, how does she work with, find someone like you and work effectively with someone like you or someone or someone on your team? Yeah, it's, I would say it's definitely more time intensive for the agent, for a new investor, because most of my time is spent typically educating the client on whatever they're trying to do based on what they're telling me. Because a lot of new investors, they don't quite speak the language yet. They know enough to get around. But when you start asking them the, the deeper questions, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And the last thing I would want to do as an agent 
is what I see a lot of agents do where they let's say force a sale, but they'll know that their client is ignorant in a certain area and they'll still just say, oh, no, this is a great opportunity. You should totally buy it just to try to get reps and transactions. But that's the last thing I want. I, the one reason I work with investors and I love working with investors is because if you treat them well, they're going to be repeat clients and they're typically sure. friends with more investors who bring you more clients. You know what I mean? It becomes this kind of what I like to call self-licking ice cream cone. And so <laughs> if, if you have this, if I treat you well, and you make money, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to want to put more of your money or more of your investors money into that same area and, and keep growing. And so, yeah, anyways, going back to your question of speaking with newer agents, that's where I spend most of my time is educating them because I want them to succeed. I want them to be in a position of, of success. How do you like you're, you, you have one Airbnb, for example, right? And you want to mm -hmm. grow. But what are some, what are resources that you point your clients to, uh, so to, they, get, to get themselves educated? Sure. So if they don't have an, an Airbnb in my area, it's first thing is going to be understanding the area in general. So we'll talk about things like insurance. Insurance in Florida right now <laughs> is like a wild ride. And I'll jump 20 to 30 minutes in a conversation just about insurance. So they understand what they're jumping into and, and, and the risks and rewards of that. I'll talk about things like what we call Cobra zones along Florida, which are Coastal Barrier Relief Act zones that may have implications on insurance or may have implications on certain types of loans. We'll have a lot of investors because it's a military, heavily military area. A lot of investors will want to you know, use a VA loan to purchase their short term rentals. And you can't do that in a Cobra zone. So I need to like I need to convey these points that are pretty crucial to our local area. And then beyond that, it's just them understanding, let's say they have an Airbnb in, in I was going to say New York City, but I know that's more and more restrictive and if it's even possible anymore. But let's say they have an Airbnb in the Smokies. They need to understand the seasonality differences and expectations. I've had an investor call me they, over after they had June, July, and August, which are pretty good months generally in Florida. They crushed it. They call me, hey man, made an extra 40 grand. I just bought myself a new car. I'm like, dude, that's exciting. <laughs> but do you know like... You're entering the dry spell, right? Like it's about to get not pretty for the next six months. Are you prepared for the winter that's coming? And they're like, "Oh, yeah, I'll be fine." And then five months later, they call me like, oh, "I got to pay out of I got to pay out of pocket in order to make this happen." Yeah, it's interesting that just educating them on the process of seasonality and the differences of if, if they already have one. If they don't have one, you're starting baseline foundational information. You're, I'm teaching them just the basics of how to run an operation, how to automate messaging, how to automate reviews, and all that fun stuff. That's a lot of handholding and that's what, don't worry about the background noise. Yeah. That's a lot of handholding. It's anything that's you really, you start, you really earn your fee, right? That's a lot to do. All right. Now yeah. let's, so I think for the, if you're a beginner investor, when I say beginner, you could own long-term rentals. It's a very different, some of the similar diligence, maybe physical diligence where you're like, okay, let's make sure the yep. foundation isn't shot or the roof isn't shot. But operationally, it's just a very different way of looking at revenue, looking at costs. Oh, yeah. right? Your costs are not just your principal interest, taxes, insurance, yep. or HOA fees. Like you have... You're paying for electricity, your repairs, mm -hmm. all cleaning. So it's a whole different thing. So really get educated. I, I think it's really incumbent on the investor to get educated themselves on a baseline of knowledge before they go and look at not do bad deals. Cause like the worst thing you do for your real estate career is do that your first deal is a bad deal. And then oh, yeah. you know, it's just, it's a tough hold to climb out of. Okay. I will say one final thought on that point. I will say, I think my hardest clients are the ones who have a fairly decent portfolio of only long-term rentals because they, they come in with that expectation of they want to, they want to have a solid understanding of exactly what number they're going to hit when it comes to revenue projections. And then I'll show them a property. And I'll show them the top performers. I'll show them 50, 50%, 75%, 25% performers. And they're like, you're telling me this property can make anywhere from 150000 to $50,000? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, potentially. But here's what you should do in order to hit the top 25%. And here's why I would use this number in my calculations. But they have a hard time with that. For long-term rental, it's so easy. Everything in this area is renting from $2,500 to $2,700 a month. There's your $200 swing in expectations. It's, it's not as easy in in the short yeah, term. it comes down to the operation side and you, you can buy the best property, but if you're the world's worst operator, like you're not going to hit that number that you're unlikely to hit that sweet spot in the range that you want. Now, conversely, if you're a good operator the opportunity, maybe and there's room for you to bring up that gross revenue to a number that other people might not be able to. And I know where that's where we shine because we can, okay, they're doing this. I could look at someone's calendar and be like, okay, I know I can do this and this, and I'll be able to yes. increase my NOI to, to X, Y, and Z. Okay. Absolutely. So that's another point to emphasize is you as an operator, like you as an Airbnb investor, like depending on the, the amount of time and effort that you're going to put into that property, it's going to drive a lot of the profitability. Oh, yeah. Right. It's, it's like buying an investment versus buying a service industry, right? Because it's all about service in the Airbnb world.
like you got to make sure you get those reviews. Well, yeah. So it's a different, so I think people need to orient on that. That's, it's a different game. Okay. Now let's talk about experienced investors. And <laughs> I, I definitely have very specific instructions to buying agents that work for us or, or represent us or purportedly represent us. Yes. <laughs> there you go. I like that. But talk about what are some of the pains from actually the agent side or working with people like mm-hmm. the people that have done this for a while? I think some of the biggest struggles are the people who have succeeded incredibly well in 2020, 2021, 2022 with interest rates and prices. And they have those same expectations in today's market. Not that we can't hit those marks, but as an example, in Destin, we, you could buy a five bedroom property for four hundred and fifty, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 in 2020, and it would have brought in $100,000 a year easily. And you're hitting 20% gross for these numbers that are fantastic. And at, the, at that time, you're also looking at incredibly low interest rates. Insurance was way low or like... It was just, a, it was a soup of perfection for buying short-term rentals. You know what I mean? And today it's the exact opposite on almost all of those variables. Prices are up, interest rates are up and in- insurance rates are, are killing a lot of deals. It's almost more, it's, I don't want to say educating the experienced investors, but setting a more of a realistic expectation for those investors when they send me, Hey, I've already done this five times. Here's, give me another one like this. Yeah. I, I would love to send that to you right now, but It may not happen or, and so anyway, that's the first thing is expectation management, I think for experienced investors who've experienced relatively recent success in the past couple of years. And beyond that, I think the most difficult part is they don't want to sift through uh, a bunch of opportunities. So it's not time spent educating them necessarily. It's more time spent sifting through deals to make sure I'm sending them ones that make sense. And so if someone sends me very specific criteria, like you guys have sent, I may not send you anything for a month or two, or I'm just sending you the auto blast that just sending you properties in general. And I feel bad, right? Because I'm like, I'm literally analyzing all these deals and they're just not hitting your criteria. And I'm doing, a, I'll do a bunch of behind the scenes work that may not be reflected into the investor. So they may think you're lazy, but I don't want to send them crap just to send them crap. So those are the challenges with experienced investors. Yeah, that's, I think it's great to, for the experienced investor listening, when you don't, I went through that journey too. It's okay, why are not sending stuff? And it's because, well, there's something there to send you. And I, <laughs> and what I don't, what I, what I don't want is the drip of like stuff that doesn't hit my mark. And because it's a waste of time, like I'm just going to, I'm just going to filter your email and I won't even look at it actually. So it's better actually just because when I see your emails, Matt, I actually will open it because I know like it's a thoughtful, there's some thought process behind it. It may or may not work, but at least someone yeah. actually looked at it. It's not just the screen from the, M- the local MLS. And I'm still looking for those, not 2020 vintage deals, but I'm still, we're still looking for things that, that work. And my challenge is, I don't know, what's it? So in the markets I'm looking at, typical cash on cash is us self-managing. It is the mid-teens, call it 15%. You see a lot of those. And I think to myself, oh man, I'm borrowing all this money. I'm doing all this work and I'm getting 15%. Now, conversely, it's actually really good if you look yeah. at all the other options that are out there and mm-hmm. cash on cash return, as folks know, don't include the debt pay down that you're getting every single year too. So that's another three points generally. Oh, on, for sure. On, yeah. on return, right? Because you're, you're paying down the principal mm-hmm. and it paying down more and more than principal as the loan amortizes. I don't have a specific point here, but it's more, yeah, no, I must, I, I get the frustration. I think, but it, more like voicing the frustration on the investor side too, because we're, you're borrowing, you're putting a million dollar house down, you're putting 200K down, you got to put another 50 to get it up to get it up and running. Plus the fees, right? You're borrowing yep. 800. I guess a million dollars of capital you're putting in. And you're like, sure. I'm earning 15% on the 200. And you're like, ah, oh, like 35K. And I'm doing all this work. I was like, oh man. And I got the insurance risks. And yeah. so that's I- where, and that's where it's so hard on, on our side to pull the trigger. We found some more stuff where recently, I think the market's come back a little bit, but yeah. to the buyer saver a little bit, but I'm just a conversation. That's the frustrations that work. That yeah, no, I, you're, I'm right there with you. So I'm not just an agent who doesn't buy. So I'm an agent who's actively looking to grow my portfolio as well. And you just look at the number of transactions in general from NAR from last year. It was basically at half of what it was in previous years. And so it was a large correction when it comes to number of transactions. So we had to really shift to trying to be more creative as much as we could. A vast majority of our investor deals that we're selling nowadays come from creative solutions. Seller financing has always been a thing, but even more emphasized now where when we can do that. We just I just got approval today for a loan assumption that we've been working for an investor. And this loan assumption we've been working for the past six and a half months and literally got an email this morning saying, hey, you're approved, clear to close. And so six and a half months of working with this lender to try to get an assumption approved. And then sub two, closing subject two has been, it's like the newest, hottest thing that everyone wants to talk about because it's a really, it, it is a powerful thing, a powerful tool in today's market. It's, that is the creative tool that is just prime for where we sit with the interest rates and the environment where we are right now. And so we've closed uh, a, a lot of deals using those creative solutions in order to make it happen and still achieve 
the return that makes sense. So rather than getting a 15% cash on cash, you now might be looking at 25%, which is a much more exciting kind of number to see. Yeah. Yeah. No, shout out to Matt here. Matt, Matt spent like 45 minutes on the phone with me probably like a month ago. I was looking at some <laughs> deal in Destin and, you know, and I think some very specific Florida things that I hadn't thought about actually. And it just reinforces the point on finding a really knowledgeable agent in that specific market that you're looking for. It really is. I've been doing this for a long time and as Matt was like insurance part and there's two other things. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I didn't know this and I'm glad I asked you. But let's, yeah. I think it's going to be a really good segue to the other part of the conversation I want to have was buying, right? You're in like half your day is... As an agent running your team, working with your clients, other half you're the client, right? Like you're looking at yeah. buying stuff, and you know you, I, you're much smarter than me, so I'm just still doing our short <laughs> totally. rentals. You have 750 doors and doing a lot of other things. Like maybe let's just start off though. Why didn't you just focus on short term rentals? Why have you now graduated and done long term, mid term, short term RVs? apartment syndications. Let's talk yep. about that a little bit. One of the reasons is as an agent, I've always told my clients, if I see a deal, I'm going to pass it to you first. I can almost guarantee you if I had never said that, I would have a much larger short-term rental portfolio and would probably be almost exclusively focused on that. So because of the kind of the role that I set early on that I would pass my deals to my client and my clients first, I think that was a little bit of a limiting factor in my portfolio growth in short-term rentals because that's all of my clients were basically short-term rental investors and that's where it came from. And so that's one of the, one of the for sure limiting factors. Beyond that, I'm just, I'm the type of guy who's very opportunistic, right? So if I see something that makes sense and I understand the risk and reward, then I'm willing to jump in and, and, and accept that risk for the potential upside of the reward. One of the reasons I don't haven't invested in, in crypto is because I don't quite understand the risk reward profile there. But when it comes to something that's an offshoot of short-term rentals, when I jumped into long-term rentals or to flips or to mobile home parks or RV parks or syndications, it's almost just like a derivation of the same. So it was easy enough to translate and learn that language and understand the risk reward and then jumped into that. So it was just testing the waters from there. So let me ask you, what makes the most sense now, right? Like short-term rentals, like you said, or overall real estate transactions down 50%. And then we've talked about some of the limitations on short-term rentals right now. What else gets you excited and compare that with a series? I will. So I generally invest along the, like the Sun Belt, So like coastal Gulf Coast region, plus or minus a hundred miles or so. What gets me excited right now are the things that mitigate my two biggest kryptonites right now, which are interest rates and insurance. Mm -hmm. I found that the RV park, mobile home park world really mitigate both of those. In the RV park space, you generally just pay for liability insurance. So I'm not worried about property insurance and liability still is relatively reasonable on rates. And then typically it's very common to see seller financing or creative financing in the space. We're mitigating with lower interest rates and typically higher cap rates. And that, that space gets me really excited right now is the RV park, mobile home park space. Do the kind of macro factors, macroeconomic factors, is that is a tailwind or maybe just, tra just translate that as we're having slower job growth, higher interest rates, consumer spending slowing down. Is that pushing yeah. more yeah. MERS to the, I don't want to say non-traditional housing, but no. affordable housing. We like to say affordable yeah. housing. Affordable housing. <laughs> Yeah, it, it becomes, can you get any lower, right? <laughs> What's a lower class of living than a mobile home or RV park? Now, that all, be, that all then will dictate what type of RV or mobile home park you're buying. Because there are some beautiful class A RV parks or where people are p paying. There's some we were looking at the other day. People were paying $250,000 to buy a 1,200 square foot pad for an RV. Because it's like prime location. Everyone loves it. It's all on the coast. That's not the type that I like to purchase. At the same time, I don't like to be at the other end of the spectrum of, of a slumlord. That's the last thing I want to be associated with is, is slumlord living. Where I like the kind of C plus, B minus class space of the RV mobile home park world where you can do something easy to upgrade it and improve the quality of the life of the tenants. Mm. And it's, I just, I like the change aspect. I like improving people's lives as much as I can. I'm not at the point where I can just easily infuse 10 million and make some great park that makes some big changes, but a couple hundred grand we can throw in there and maybe upgrade from a dirt road to a gravel road or a gravel road to a nice paved road, which makes a big difference for these type of parks and, and these people, they really appreciate it. Okay, cool. Now that's an RV park. I only to talk to you offline on that because RV parks, I know from other folks, it's a good way to, it's a lot of depreciation there too. Yeah. My, so my first short-term rental that I told you about the, that I met the, the group from China, China at, it was awesome. But that one we bought when prices were cheap, prices had appreciated and we wanted to take advantage of the equity. So we ended up selling it and did a 1031 exchange to buy my second RV park. So we exchanged into it and bought the RV park for 2 million. And we did a cost segregation study on my first, on that second RV park. And I was massively surprised for a $2 million purchase. We depreciated like 1.285 million. Yeah. Uh, so it's like 65%. It's like crazy. Yeah. yeah. Versus it was like 
30, yeah, short runs like 30% less to land. I know it's, I know yeah. I gotta, I, we gotta talk cause I gotta <laughs> do this. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta invest with you and get some depreciation benefits. Yeah. Cause I can't, the insurance in Florida is crazy, but let's end up Florida because of your other name, Roar, right? Yes. Let's talk about before you were identifying real estate, you were identifying <laughs> hostile targets from heads up display. <laughs> That's tell right. Your, tell us about your Military sure, sure. Yes. I had the awesome opportunity of flying fighter jets in the Air Force for 11 years. I, I loved it. It was as awesome as every little boy expects it to be flying fighter jets. A lot of long, hard days, a lot of difficulty to get to that point. But once you achieve that status of being a fighter pilot in the Air Force, it's a pretty amazing ride. So I did that for 11 years, flew all over, all over the world and deployments, all that fun stuff. And, and then one day I got accepted to the top gun program for the air force for the F-35, which is the newest joint stealth fighter we have. So think of the newest, nicest fighter jet we have in the military, basically. And I was accepted to the very first top gun program there. So I was like, literally like the tip of the spear, like you got accepted. I'm like, holy crap, this is like amazing. And as I was preparing to go to this top gun school, I just randomly felt ill I got out of breath really is what it was one day when i was in a hotel and i went to my flight doc they did a scan on my chest and all of a sudden we found that there were nine large tumors in my chest one of them was the size of a softball between my heart and my spine out of the blue completely out of the blue no cancer history in my family or anything like that and yeah so from there like from being on top of the world like tip of the spear going to this very first top gun school to literally about two weeks later getting ready to start chemotherapy with when they finally identified what type of cancer it was. And I also went to the doctor and they found some heart issues where I went to the doctor, some heart pain. And he said, Hey Matt, your, your heart's probably going to stop working in the next 48 hours. So you need surgery like now. And so we had to get heart surgery the very next day. And so it was a matter of this massive life-changing event in two weeks from being on top of the world to being like completely humbled in the matter of two weeks. Okay. I get it. I get it. I'm not all that in a bag of chips, right? Like I, I get it. And it was a big transition moment. And from there, the Air Force eventually, after you know, successfully going through chemo and, and overcoming the cancer and the heart stuff, the Air Force decided they, I am no longer fit for service because I had some internal lung damage and I was given the boot. I got an email from the Air Force one day uh, as I was waiting for the results for like this medical board that I was going through. And the email just said, Hey, thank you for your service. You have 10 days to vacate the Air Force. And my commander got the email at the same time. So I had a 10 day warning to leave this most secure job that I could think of being a military pilot. And I was out after 10 days. And luckily during my chemotherapy time, I, the writing was on the wall that I might be getting the boot. And so that's when I started looking into real estate, starting getting into sales, really educating myself. And I spent prior to the cancer stuff, I would spend 10 to 12 hour days in a top secret vault studying our enemy's tactics on how we can you know do these things in top secret situations where then I was in a hospital and I would just study real estate tactics for 10 to 12 hours. It was just, I would just like fully immersed, man. And I just, it was a very trans uh, transformative experience for me. I think first off, thanks for sharing the story and thank you for the service. I think we all no. appreciate the ones that are out there in the front lines protecting the country and yeah, no, it's obviously we talked about this before. I, I don't think you ever went into this too much detail with me. Yeah. It's tough coupling when you were married at the time, children. Right? Yeah. Four kids. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I would say that the, the toughest thing was realizing, for those of you who have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, was realizing that I truly had that poor dad mentality. Because the moment I realized, I looked at my savings account, I only had $2,000 in my savings account. I just, money came in, money came out, but it was guaranteed money. I think I was getting a salary. I didn't realize how, how much of a mistake it was the way I was living. You know what I mean? I, I was truly living paycheck to paycheck, but not realizing it. So the moment that paycheck was threatened, I was like, holy crap, something's got to change. Yeah, and it, it just speaks to the fragile nature of a job, right? You had a, a very gr a great job in the Air yeah. Force. So you're doing like something very few people are qualified to do. And I think the last thing you probably thought was like someone can just yank yank the carpet from under you and 10 days yeah. you're out. And that speaks to, for myself, the insecurity that I felt went through finance and had a great mm -hmm. job that was like difficult to get into and well compensated. And I just saw and people above me, like, yeah, they just sometimes they just get a knock on the door and be like, look, you're, thank you for spending 30 years here and give me up time with your wife and your family. And there's this nice severance package for you, but you're done. And <laughs> yeah. I saw that a lot. And it's just, man, the, those people that slaved away there for 18, 20 hours, gave up vacation time with their kids, never went to go see their kids play sports, didn't go back and see their family, worked whenever, even when they travel and they work. I just I was like, man, like, I, I just, I can't do that. That's just not for me. I don't care like how much money you're paying me because fundamentally I knew like they could always take that away. 
And we were lucky enough to find short-term rentals and been lucky enough to be able to grow that business. But yeah, like I think that's just the big thing I want to share with everyone too. It's just like, that could be in your situation or my situation, right? Like, or you feel so secure and you're not because you yeah. don't control your own destiny. And that's the no. nice thing about business and it's hard. Like I'm not, there's every business isn't easy. Being a real estate agent is like super competitive. It's not yeah. easy. But yes. the one thing is like you control your own outcome, right? Matt controls his own outcome. Michael controls his own. No one can take this away from me. Mm -hmm. And I, and that is a source of strength, personal strength for me is, man, no matter how hard this is, at least like I own this and no one can build here. No one can take it away from me. It's not like working at a bank where, oh man, I'm slaving for this client and I like, love me. But <laughs> yep. You know what? The person above you can be like, no, actually, no, we're going to move you yeah. to a different group. You're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing this now. Please transition X client over to Matt because Matt's taking over your role. And it's what the heck. It's an interesting kind of dichotomy because when I got out of the military and we started to go from like a guaranteed salary job to 100% performance-based job, basically is what yeah, we are as yeah. investors. I went to the extreme and I told my wife and my kids, I told them, hey guys, we only make money if I succeed here. So I'm going to be working. I know I worked a lot in military, but I'm going to be working even harder now temporarily. So I, I, I had the whole, what I call the temporary imbalancing of my life for a year or two to where it was full throttle, man. Like morning, afternoons, late nights, no, no relaxing time. It was all, it was a strain for the family, but it was an intentional strain. And I found it was difficult to throttle back a little bit, to be honest with you, as it was like, no, I'm making seven figures where this is awesome. Like never my wildest dreams would I ever thought I'd be making a million dollars a year. And then to be able to be like, oh, but I'm also crushing my relationships right now. And then to slowly pull back. Once we hit that kind of that financial altitude, if you will, that we were happy with, we were like, okay, like now we need to concentrate on more of a balanced life and, and trying to figure out how do you still succeed as an entrepreneur, but also have a good quality of life, which I think you guys do a great job of that. I think you're a great example of, of working hard, but also playing hard as a family. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's truly a point of emphasis for us. Like we we could probably could have made more money had we done other things. But I, I think I think having the benefit of 10 years in investment banking and seeing all that, I was like money and that, that stuff, it's great. And it provides optionality, but I think fundamentally and definitely into having kids now, and as you get older, <laughs> it's like that point is just reinforced. Like in the end, it's like your family that the really close people in your life. It's your family that really matters. The people that are going to be there for you when mm -hmm. you have Sorry to borrow an example, when you have nine tumors in your chest, yeah, yeah. other people around are going to be sympathetic, but ultimately like they're- Yeah, no, you're family, right. I mean, it's your family that's going to be there for you in the hospital room and be like, hey man, like, you okay? Like, can I get you some water? Let's figure out a way together versus, and, and, and that's, those are the, those relationships that, that I personally want to really invest in and make sure that I'm giving that my, they're just work. We got to make money. We got to support the kids. We got all that, but there is a balance and that balance changes from time to time, but I think having just- or for me, just like making sure that, that goal is like, that's present for me every single day. I, I really, I care about that. Yeah, I think it's uh, having a, moments like that in you know, my life with the cold cancer thing, it forces you to reevaluate what's important in life. And I'm sure you had moments, especially as you were thinking about leaving the financial industry. Oh man, is this important? Like how important is this to me? But my family is more important. I have this opportunity to, to be successful for my family and also be there for them more often. It's yeah, it's a good to have that the kind of introspective thought process every once in a while. And just pull it all together and be like, what am I doing here? Why am I doing what's, this? What's the why? Yeah. Yeah. Hey man, I really, this is a, I'm glad we did this. We've been trying to do this for a long time. I'm really yeah. glad we were able to find time together and let's definitely do this again. I'm sure the market will be different and we can see, we can, we can talk about what happens. <laughs> oh yeah. We'll see what happens with the election, with all the Fed and all the fun stuff and the market in general, man. I'm anxious. I'm really hopeful for 2024 as I know this is the beginning of the year. And if you would have asked me the same question in 2023, I would have said, it's probably going to be a rough year because all the writing was on the roll. 2023 was going to be a rough year for real estate. But yeah, I think we're going to see a pretty, pretty good recovery. Yeah. I know the sales are down, but it's actually a pretty good SDR, on SDR side. It was like, it was, it was actually really good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, especially if you're doing arbitrage. Arbitrage is one of those things I typically poo pooed, to be honest with you, as, hey, you're making yourself another job because I never thought about it as building systems and making it more of a passive thing. And yeah, there's, I'm excited. This year's going to be awesome. This yeah. going to be this year. Matt, if folks want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure. Thorgardner.com is the website. I actually have a book coming out. Hopefully at end of my goal is to have it published by end of quarter one. My original publisher went bankrupt. So that's an entirely different story. So roargardner.com, you can sign, find me there or any of the social medias. I'm at R-O-A-R Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R. We'll put your website on the show notes. Folks, if you're looking to invest in that part in the Panhandle Tampa market, you should definitely reach out to Matt and talk to him and his team. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it.